uh, Orthodox, the um, modern Orthodox, which you never mentioned. You mentioned the Orthodox, the conservative, the re uh, the Reconstructionist, but you never mentioned modern Orthodox. Where would they fit in? Um, well, I don't make much of a distinction between Orthodox and modern Orthodox. Um, and um, theologically, I don't think there is much of a distinction. Um, you know, modern Orthodox is a, in any case, I think is a, um, a disappearing phenomenon. Really? So, really? Yes. It has veered over the last 20 years further and further to the right. And, um, you know, even, you know, places like Yeshiva University that were bastions of so-called modern Orthodox thought have become much less open Thank you. to uh, modern ideas. Um, so I just don't make much of a distinction. Okay. I think it depends what, I, I am in no way an expert. I'm not, not Orthodox or Who's like speaking? modern, but... Um, I mean, this is purely anecdotal, but I have friends who classify themselves as modern Orthodox and pray in places without mechitzas. And there are, you know, I, I don't know if open Orthodox is the same as modern Orthodox, but there are places like Yeshiva Fovevei Torah, where like one of the synagogues at my, my, one of the rabbis at my synagogue came from, and they would consider themselves to be halachic, but they, you know, are comfortable without a mechitza and very egalitarian. Yes, and they constitute about one tenth of one percent of Orthodox, and if that, which isn't to say that it is not a welcome phenomenon, and I think ultimately, I mean, I would imagine, I would guess that in fifty years, the constitution of the Jewish community will change significantly in terms of. Well, which of the so-called denominations survive, which don't, what they believe, what they don't. I mean, I think we're in a very early stage of, of, of post-Holocaust reorganization. Um, modern Orthodox, the, the open Orthodox that you describe essentially are almost conservative. identical to what was conservative Judaism in the 1930s. Right. So when conservative Judaism in the 1930s made its debut, so to speak, it was halachic. Um, it was theologically unchallenging in the sense that theology was not really dealt with, uh, but it was moving toward egalitarianism and other modern accommodations. So, you know, I think that the, um, what comes around goes around. <laughs> okay, um, we have enough people here to get started. So thank you all for coming. I, I hope that the change in time did not uh, unduly affect people. Um, and I hope that everybody had a chance to read the article for this evening. Uh, let me make a few opening comments. Um, I think that I can say um, with a fair amount of accuracy that uh, Rabbi Schulweis's article takes us to what I think we could call the beating heart of Kaplan's theology. And I'd like to move through the article um, relatively quickly, depending on how much conversation we have, uh, but, but precisely to open up to conversation about this, because this really is the heart of Kaplan's theology and his, um, his movement. Um, first, let me say a word about 
Harold Schulweis. Um, Rabbi Schulweis was considered by many to be one of the primary voices of interpreting Kaplan's thought in the second half of the 20th century. He was, during most of those years, the senior rabbi of Valley Beth Shalom Synagogue in the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles. He also taught at what was then the University of Judaism and is now American Jewish University. Um, and he has the unenviable distinction of being my first uh, Jewish philosophy professor when I started uh, going to school at UJ. Um, he was a prodigious writer on Kaplan, what we could call Kaplanism, uh, Reconstructionism, obviously, but I call it Kaplanism because Schulweis never became a Reconstructionist. In a certain sense, following the, the example of his teacher rather than the example of those who came after Kaplan, um, Schulweis maintains him a, a strong and consistent affiliation with the conservative movement. Uh, always um, at the margins, of, if you will, on the left, but um, always a part of the conversation uh, of the conservative world. Um, I also, by way of introduction, want to define two words to make sure that, that they didn't unduly confound anybody reading uh, who may not have taken the, uh, or may not have been able to find definitions that were clear. So the first word that is, uh, is central to this article is soteric. Uh, and soteric, uh, I would define as having to do with salvation. Simple as that. It's a, it, it, it has a, a, something of a pedigree in philosophical literature, but, but a very minor one. And Kaplan kind of jumped on it and made it the, um, uh, the term for the metaphysical underpinnings of his system. And the second word is heuristic, right? So if you didn't have a chance, heuristic is an interpretive tool, which it is by, by definition yields an uncertain explanation, right? An explanation of some idea or phenomena that is inherently uncertain, but contains enough certainty for practical purposes. Something like a, between a proof and a hypothesis. Right. So it's, it's a way of interpreting phenomena, the world, or a text um, that makes sense, that seems to explain the phenomena, but does not make any truth claims, right? uh, but rather stays open to the possibility that it may be, uh, may be wrong. Okay, so I hope that um, helps a little bit. All right, so now moving on to the details. Uh, Schulweis begins by restating or posing in, in this article, but I think restating for us, what he considers to be the central problem motivating Kaplan's work. And he says, I'm paraphrasing, that if there's a God wholly independent of human beings and whose nature lies outside human experience, in what sense can such a God be known by humans and be meaningful to them? Right? So this is the question of um, the transcendent, the transcendent supernatural God uh, who is beyond human comprehension, beyond human experience, um, totally outside the realm of human being, so to speak, 
Um, for for Schulweis, this presents the central problem for Kaplan, for because such a god, to put it kind of mildly, makes no difference. Right? A god who is beyond human humanity makes no difference. Now, I hope in the second part of today's class, when we can maybe have some conversation, that we can um, we can evaluate this claim as to whether or not we think this is accurate, whether or not we think that this would be sufficient to motivate Kaplan, etc. But that's the problem that Schulweis identifies. Uh, and then he offers a solution. Um, he says, the source of the meaningful attributes of God, and uh, by which I think he means things like justice, mercy, order, uh, goodness, these attributes of God are discovered through experiences between human beings and between human beings and the natural world. Okay. In fact, the very search for God that the religion in the very search for God, the religious naturalist seeks his clues as to the nature of the divine. In other words, the fact that human beings search for God, search to identify some source of uh, to ground these experiences of goodness, mercy, justice, etc., is, um, is a hint, as Shulwais says, as to the nature of the divine. And he continues, he may come to know that when men claim to have experienced a revelation of a supernatural being, they often confuse the reality of the experience with the experience of the reality. Okay, so I want to just stop there for a second. Um, this is the problem and this is the um, solution as it were. So let's see if we can understand that stated in our own terms and then decide to what extent we think it is a valid um, not so much a valid understanding of Kaplan, which we'll take for granted that it is, uh, but rather a valid understanding of some of the, of the things that we think are the issues for contemporary and modern religious person. So what do you think, first of all, of the problem? Is this the problem? Is the fact that God is so, that if there were a God, it would be so impossible to consider this God having any impact on us? Anybody want to comment on that? Okay, David. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So a God who is so divorced from human activity, but has these virtues which are, of course, the virtues of any kind of civil society become such an abstraction that, as I've said before in the classes on the, on the uh, Torah, God just becomes a metaphor for all these good things. Well, that's precisely, in some, to some degree, what Kaplan is arguing or what Schulweis is arguing, right? But, uh, and, and I love that line, right? The, the men who claim to have experienced the revelation um, confuse the reality of the experience with the experience of the reality, right? So somehow in the course of human interaction, we experience insights, if you will, uh, into the nature of reality and in particular the nature of morality and its its hold on us, and we attribute those insights to a supernatural God. That's the argument here. 
and and to go back to take the other side of the coin we've all of us to some extent have from our earliest years have had some been told that there's a god of some kind i mean god is part of our we got it in our mother's milk so it's just as easy to say that that the insight that we attribute to God is only because we've been told that there is a God. If we grew up in a society where God was never mentioned, um, we might still have these same attributes because as I say, they're the attributes of a civil society. No, there I think uh, Schulweis would disagree with you, David, because he uh, again attributes to Kaplan the idea that these are in fact universal um, uh, the, the cultural characteristics that human beings um, inevitably um, develop what we might call the God idea, even though it isn't something that they learned. Right? Somebody somewhere at the beginning had to come up with the idea, and the idea um, is precisely um, a, a translation, if you will, of an overwhelming experience of meaning or of value or of morality, which then is so um, um, all encompassing that the individual can only attribute it to a higher power. Just as we would talk later uh, in other ways about, and I think we may have talked about it here, uh, that when an artist finishes a work of art after being really in a frenzy, right? Painting or sculpting or writing, and then sits back and looks at it and says, where the heck did this come from? I was the, I was the vehicle, but I don't know where it came from. Now clearly, at least according to a rationalist point of view, it could come, it could have come from nowhere other than inside that human being's um, um, psyche, imagination, brain, you take your pick. But the experience is so uncanny and overwhelming that, the, um, that, the, that, that it is not uncommon to attribute it to some outside force. But essentially what Kaplan and Schulweis are saying is that that's what really has happened historically in every culture. Um, universally, right? And on a certain level, there's, they're saying there's nothing necessarily wrong with that until you, you get to a culture which is suffused with scientific and rational um, uh, knowledge in which the in which the attribution of these values to an outside um, external God figure no longer makes rational sense. And at that point, the system breaks down. And it's in the breakdown of the system that Kaplan wants to st uh, step into the, to the fray, right? Anybody else? Okay, so at least for the moment, we're going to say that those two um, points, that is the, the problem and the solution, um, summarize Schulweis's summary, if you will, of Kaplan's metaphysics. And the reason that I want to move on from the metaphysics is both because Schulweis moves on and also because he makes a very salient point. He says, um, well, uh, I'll hold that for a minute, but basically what he says is that in the end, Kaplan is not as interested in metaphysics as he is in ethics and behavior anyway, so we shouldn't get too caught up on the metaphysics. Um, but before we get to that, the third point, if you will, of metaphysics that Schulweis raises 
or brings to our attention, and he calls, calls it the truly revolutionary ca character of Kaplan's satirical approach is in the humanistic interpretation of personal salvation. Only to the extent to which one consciously realizes every humanizing potentiality in oneself and others, will one attain a measure of personal salvation and an experience of godliness. Now, I don't want to be overcritical of Schulweis or of Kaplan, but I do want to take, um, I, I, I want us to take a minute or two or three to unpack that statement, assuming that it comes from Kaplan, which it, it doesn't quite, but let's say uh, it's Schulweis, Kaplan in the voice of Schulweis. Right? And I want to see what, whether we can make sense of it. What does it mean? And what are the issues that it raises? Only to the extent to which one consciously realizes every humanizing potentiality in oneself and others will one attain a measure of personal salvation and an experience of godliness. Somebody please explain that to me. We have many opportunities during the day to make decisions about how we're going to behave. And all of the different humanistic aspects that are being alluded to oh, here. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. What, how do you know what is a humanistic, what is a humanizing potentiality? Something that I, well, for me, what that means is an urge to do the best, to do the, to do good, to enhance goodness, to enhance beauty. That's what it means to oh, me. And on what basis can you say that? I'm not picking on you, Shomo, I'm just using it. It's okay, I, I understand. On the, on the, on what basis can I say that? I say that. How, how, do, you know what, how do you know what good is? Good, I think, is derived, and I go back to what David was saying earlier about the social context. And I'm not sure there is such a thing as goodness when there is one person in the world. But as soon as there is two, and there is relationship between them, notions of what is good develop. And as society gets more complicated, and we depend more and more on different aspects of society, there are certain actions which could be good, and there are certain actions which could be bad. Okay, I'll take that for the moment. Okay, so and, we'll... so, and so my feeling is in terms of all the different humanistic aspects that are alluded to here, I was beginning to say that during a day we must make thousands of decisions. And every one of those decisions has the possibility of being the best possible decision. And the more decisions we make that are the best possible decision in terms of enhancing goodness, enhancing beauty, enhancing respect, and all the other humanistic things we could talk about, each one of those is a step toward personal salvation. And as Okay, that's the next question. What is personal salvation? Being the best Anybody you else can be. be. <laughs> okay, being the best you can be. And then... How and in what way is that an experience of godliness? Anybody? Say the question again. In what way is that an experience of godliness to be the best you can be? Well, this is what Kaplan says about it. Um, <clears throat> God is that aspect of reality which elicits from us the best that is in us and enables us to bear the worst that can fall us, can befall us. Where is that God located? In one's consciousness, I think. Um, 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 God, yeah, in, in, in one's consciousness. 
Um, so then what's gained by calling it God? Well, I find that it'd be very, I, I'm, I'm trying to find it as we're gathered here, I'm trying to find a definition or a linguistic um, derivation for the word God. And, um, you know, we need, I don't know where the word God comes from, but it stands for a power that exists within the universe. Um, okay. So I, that uh, is a classic, that's a classic Kaplanian idea. That's and why that there, I, that, that, there, that there's a power in the universe that makes for or, or um, elicits, as you, I think you yes. said, mm -hmm. elicits goodness, elicits um, um, our in, behavior in a, in a particularly godly fashion, right? So this is the power that makes for salvation, right? Okay. But, but there's, a, there's a problem even in defining what's good Take China, which is a pure dictatorship, and yet I don't think there's any doubt that Xi is trying to make the country as good as he can for the people, but he's doing it through methods that in many cases, I think appall Westerners and especially people like us who are concerned with democracy and fairness and, and justice. So even the, the, the definition of these terms that we want to attribute to God are necessarily, to some extent, cultural. Um, yes, and 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 Schulweis points it out that um, that these um, these moral qualities and the and the, and as well as the theological ideas are expressed in different ways in different cultures. Um, yes, Ivan. Well, to answer one of your questions before, why call it God? If, if somebody has an idea of what is the best he can be or, what is the, or what's a good for society, calling it God or coming from God is because he's trying to impose it almost to everybody else. It's not just personal, it's universal because God is universal. So it's, try, it's trying to make what the personal good into a something that everybody else should also follow. Yes, and not only that, but of course in Kaplan's system, the personal good is not is impossible unless it is part of a cultural, societal, communal good. Right? So we are not just trying to make the world better for us, but rather we are trying to reach a level of, yeah. of, of morality that takes in um, the entire community. Barbara? Barbara? What's, what's Jewish about this? In other words, what's, don't basically all, most religions or most systems want to do what in fact he's saying? So what makes this uniquely Jewish? Um, well, I mean, that's, so Kaplan's answer, I think, would be that uh, what makes it uniquely Jewish is the form it takes in the context of Jewish history and sociology, right? If you are a Christian, then Judaism has nothing to, to say to you. And if you are a Jew, then Judaism is the way in which your culture historically has encountered these ideas, translated them into powerful stories and rituals. And to the extent that those stories and rituals are culturally comforting, um, and, and in fact do help you reach your personal salvation, you should take advantage of them. But there's no compulsion Right? There's no Asher Bachar Banu. God didn't choose the Jewish people to do this, right? Because there is no God to choose. 
Fran, you were going to say something? Left on mute. Yeah. Um, I'm still stuck on what is salvation? Is it personal or is it communal? Maybe because I grew up in a place where I was the only Jewish kid and they were surrounded by Christians. To me, salvation is something that saves you from your original sin, which, which of which there is none. Not right. So I'm a little bit stuck with salvation unless you go look at the root of it, which is health and your, I guess, your psychological health. What? Okay, so good questions. Um, so obviously that's a key, right? And, and I was trying to, to tease that out of us. Right? We take for granted that we know what he means when he says the power that makes for salvation. But what is salvation? Yes. And by the way, uh, with all due respect, there is such a thing as original sin. Ah. Right? If you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, yes. Right. So... Um, it's important that in our understanding of Kaplan or anything else, that we um, recognize that uh, every religious system is internally true to its own adherence. Oh, I grant that, but I always but, thought... Well, somebody said there was no such thing, and I just want to point Maybe out... Maybe I said, in Judaism, I thought there was... Oh, right. right. No, right. Yes, okay. I understand that very well. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, that question leads us to the next part of the article. Showai says that this idea of salvation or this experience of godliness that we've just described is based on two elementary and compulsory factors in human nature. The will to live and the will to maximum life. Right. Every human being, according to Kaplan, has an innate, instinctive, natural will to survive. More the, over, again, according to Kaplan, we not only have a will to survive, but a will to maximize our survival. Right? To um, to, in fact, um, attain a measure of personal salvation in the life that we, um, that we, that we struggle to live. Right? Uh, and he goes on to say that this will to live and will to maximum life is divided into three categories. Physical health, which includes mental health, reason, and what Schulweis calls morale. And quoting Kaplan, he says, the self is said to harbor the values of the spirit of holiness. Say that again. The self is said to harbor the values of the spirit of holiness. Okay. And holiness is the manner in which we react to persons, objects, places, and events, which we regard as indispensable to human welfare and self-realization. You self-realization is the, <clears throat> is the value we place on, um, on feeling, um, fully, um, fully evolved as far as we individually understand is the best that there is in not only in terms of our interactions, but in our response to the world around us, to nature. Um, if there is no... I hear, I hear you. I understand. So, uh, first of all, we have a mandate to make a virtue of physical health, as I said, including mental health, right? Secondly, we have a mandate to view the world primarily through the lens of reason. 
to make intelligent choices, so to speak. And third, um, to, to access the values that are somehow implicit in our selfhood, which allow us to interact with the outside world in line with our highest ideals for self-actualization. Right? So all of that, all those things together constitute the idea of salvation. Right? Um, and then Schulweis asks, and here I'm going to stop and ask you, Schulweis asks, because this is a critical commentary on Kaplan, he says, why do we need Kaplan if this is all part of human nature? And why do we need Kaplan? Why do we need religion? Why do we need anything to teach us what is so innate? It seems to me that that's an awfully elitist approach to uh, describing the world. I think that most people are just happy to live day to day. Uh, if they make it to the next day, if they're, if they're able to work, if they have some kind of money coming in so they can buy food for their kids, that's all they're looking for. I don't, I think this idea of achieving your best uh, is for people who have uh, the wherewithal to be able to sit back and contemplate uh, these problems. I just don't, uh, I mean, it's very nice. I would agree, I would agree maybe that's true for me, but it wasn't, it's not true for most of the clients I had when I was practicing. Okay, we'll come back to that. That's because you are defining Abe, what is good me. for someone oh, wait, else. Wait, 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 wait. Abe, you want to say uh, It's been written about a lot. Uh, David Brooks has written about it lately, especially. A community. That it's very tough to do this as a rugged individual. We have the BS concept of John Wayne, the rugged individual and he is getting salvation on his own. In real life, that is very, very unusual. You need the support of the community. You have to feel part of the community, feel part of your family. Uh, that's absolutely true. And that's certainly central to Kaplan's understanding of the, the way in which religion functions. But I want to go back to my question. Um, assuming that this analysis is correct, that every human being has the will to live and the will to maximum life, that every human being is concerned with his or her health, uh, that every human being has a rational faculty to help them make decisions, and that every human be being's, every human self harbors values that are essentially the spirit of holiness, then why don't people act that way? Because I think Kaplan isn't, I, I think Kaplan is fantasizing. I just don't think that's true. Well, let's, let's hear if anybody else has an opinion on it. I mean, well, maybe these aren't the only things that are essential to, to life, health, reason, and, and mor morality, he called moral and morality. I mean, because you can't, you also mentioned, and we've mentioned many times, our, our will to survive or our self-interest. That's also part of it, although that may not necessarily be one of the three that's been pointed out here. And the whole struggle that we have is overcoming and keeping in a reasonable size our self-interest. If we can do that, if we can contain our self-interest, 
then maybe these other things, these other qualities that are talking about, these other characteristics can overcome that. But when you talk about self-interest, I think we're going through that right now because suddenly we are much more concerned with our health than we were before. We used to just walk outside and do whatever we wanted. Yeah, but to do. health is health is not just physical. Health is the quality of life that we as That's individuals, right. part of a whole to which we must relate and how we relate to the whole defines our humanity, not out and and not out of fear, but out of real at, but out of a realization that with our intellect there is imagination, and those lead us to an awareness of a quality of life, of a quality of how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about ourselves, even the things that we don't understand. That's why there's also a concern with how we treat the environment and how we respond and react to and treat nature. But our quality of, our quality of life has diminished in the last four, uh, three, four months. However, the quality so, wait, of wait, life, wait, wait, because wait, wait, wait. you can't go to the store and you have to worry about breathing. Uh, no, the quality of life depends upon the atmosphere in which we are experiencing this. The human, the psychological, the emotional, the respectful, the imaginative okay, atmosphere. Okay, 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 okay. Hold it, everybody. Hold it. Okay, so... Um, the terms of this conversation are without question the terms of um, Kaplan's metaphysics, right? The idea that a human being has some innate quality that allows that human being to strive to reach beyond what we might call the animal level, right? The will to survive is the animal level. The will to maximize life um, transcends the mere physical, the mere survival, and includes um, essential values. And that these essential values um, have a direct impact on how we experience the worth or quality of our life, right? Um, and, and clearly they are not, um, a, they are not, um, um, they're not possible to uh, interact with without taking into consideration the social and uh, communal aspect of who we are. Because being in community is both an element of the will to live, right? Human beings basically cannot survive alone. So it is a survival uh, instinct. You mean humanity um, cannot survive alone, not the human being? No, I meant what I said, thank you. The individual cannot survive without the group. Um, but the survival of the individual is not um, merely uh, to, 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 um, uh, to breathe, live and breathe, but rather to um, feel the humanizing values of interaction with other human beings, the creation of culture, the creation of beauty, the creation of meaning, the creation of those things which give life, um, which separate life, if you will, from mere bestiality. All of this Kaplan undertakes as being representative of the, um, of the divine in the human, um, uh, in the human um, equation or experience, yeah. 
And that is what has been diminished. Our, our sociability has been diminished. Our cultural um, atmosphere has been diminished. It just is in health that I was talking about. I was talking about being able to go out and, and socialize with some people, being able to go to a concert, being able to uh, even walk on the streets without any problem. That is okay, so we, we, will, we, is, we will agree, um, Stanley, that um, we are experiencing some unexpected imp impediments to our being able to be fully uh, human at the moment. Right, right. Um, let's keep in mind that they are probably uh, very... Um, Temporary. Temporary. And most of us, I think, have the resources intellectually, imaginatively, spiritually, and financially to, um, to, to, to put up with this for a little while longer. Um, Sharon, you were going to say something? What? Yeah. I was. I, I was just going to go back to the earlier comment. I'm sorry, I don't remember who made it about whether or not this is an elitist idea. And the thing that popped into um, my head was, uh, first of all, the combination, the will to live is certainly about survival, right? The first level is survival. So that is something that everybody experiences. But the idea of self-actualization, of living a fulfilled life, I think it is something that everybody thinks about regardless of what their means are and how they're able to actualize that. And I was thinking about um, Kaplan's uh, Haggadah, um, I think it's like the 1946 Haggadah, Haggadah which has this very powerful, it's, it's one of my favorite, I mean, it's the one that I grew up with. So it's, it, it has this uh, very powerful statement at the beginning about how um, we we are all enslaved. The freedom we speak of is not just uh, you know, um, freedom and slavery. It's also an emotional slavery. It's also really not being able to self-actualize oneself. And so I, I, you know, this idea that this is only available to people who already have resources, I think is not fair. I think everybody strives to live a full life in regardless of what their means are. So I was just reflecting more on that. No, I agree. It's a, it's a very important point, and I agree. I think that there is, if you will, a place for the elite in, in the structure, right? Uh, I think that everybody has this desire to experience what Kaplan calls self-actualization. Some people are better equipped intellectually or imaginatively to translate that desire into story, into meaning, into ritual, uh, into some kind of way in which the average person can participate, as it were. Part of what we do in religious services is we participate in an act of self-actualization. Um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you know, vicariously, the community is lifted up by song, by vert, by prayer, by sacrifice, even for those of you who are not turned off by that, um, by whatever the religious ritual is. And the individual shares in that experience. So even the person who cannot articulate what would be self-actualization for him or for her is in a certain sense given definition by the self-actualization that is developed culturally by a particular community. Um, that said, I will have to say, and Sharon, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that in the, as the Reconstructionist movement spread, it was often in fact criticized for being elitist. Uh, in that the in that the kind of people who tended to join Chavurot 
and sit around and rather than sit and use the Siddur, would meditate on Kaplan's rather wordy Siddur. Um, it was all about the intellect. It was all about talking. Um, and, uh, and that was at least one of the criticisms that one often heard. I, I think that's very much <clears throat> fair. I just, I just think that, um, I don't want to say that the idea of self-actualization is an entirely elitist idea. That, Absolutely. that, that yeah. That, that, but in practice, that. in practice, in terms of where Reconstructionism went, the people attracted to it, it was those who wanted to engage in a certain kind of intellectual exchange and who didn't want to sit passively in a synagogue and you know receive what was going to. Yeah, you know, we've got, we've got people who are self, uh, who are in groups, who are supporting each other, who are the Trump supporters, whose values at least seem to be antithetical to mine, and I think most of the people in this group. And yet, you talk to them, and they think that they're, they're doing God's work. I mean, it seems to me that the values that we're talking about are the values, as I say, the people of this group, which we think are good, which we think are the way to promote a just and, and good society. We're not the plenty of societies, that, uh, China, as I say, is one of them. Um, even the Nazis thought that they were doing the right thing. They, they were going to build Germany up. They were going to put German values, which were great values, at the top of the world, and Germany would, would create an empire that would last a thousand years. I mean, all of this seems to me to make sense, depending where you're coming from. And uh, who is that? So Kaplan, I think, would say, and I'm not, David? I'm not debating, David, that your criticisms really are well taken. David Holmes. Right. But that, having said that, I think that Kaplan would argue that um, there is an experience of self-actualization that by definition um, is experienced as the, as the, um, as seeking the, the, um, the good in oneself and in the other. And the good not to be defined by political or material terms, but rather by a true, um, a, a true awareness of how to support and value the life of every other person, such that that person also can reach his or her self-actualization. The examples that you have given us, David, are share one common denominator, which is that my or the elite government's decision as to what's good or bad is imposed on each individual. By definition, that can't be good, by Kaplan's definition. Goodness can only be that which encourages each individual to find his or her own um, self-actualization. It is profoundly democratic uh, and it is profoundly democratic on purpose because Kaplan recognizes or at least suggests that democracy is a um, is an expression if you will of the godly, an, exp an expression of the holy. Okay. Now, okay, so I don't think it's just about, um, you know, differences in opinion as to what's right or wrong. I think that there, that he would suggest that there are verifiable um, elements of the way in which human beings behave, which, which, which define something as being truly self-actualizing and not. And one of the elements would be um, the support and concern for the other person, um, support and concern for the natural world, support and concern for the 
Um, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, all of this uh, and and this idea of the um, the the life urge and the, and the and the urge for meaningful life is part of this structure of what Schulweis calls Kaplan's metaphysics. And all along the way, Schulweis, without, I think, in a rather gentle way, frankly, uh, raises the, on some level, obvious issues. Right? Um, and that is, in part, that despite the non-supernaturalist nature of the God that Kaplan wants to replace, um, he cannot escape a kind of um, a rational attribution that in many respects might as well be God, right? Or in fact is God, but just not the traditional idea of God as an anthropomorphic being. So as I've been saying through the whole course, um, the idea that God, that, 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 that seems to be the one that Kaplan focuses on, that God is primarily, that what we mean by God is primarily this supernatural anthropomorphic being who interferes and interrupts in human history, um, is a God that, um, in Kaplan's opinion, and frankly in mine, deserves to be uh, debunked. Right? It's a dangerous God. It's a it's a God that has um, many um, 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 negative qualities. That said, as I've also tried to point out, it is not the only God idea within the history of Jewish thought. Um, and I personally believe that Kaplan might have been well better served if he had better connected his in, implicit idea of a kind of God, a kind of transcendent God, or a kind of, I don't even know what is how to call it, but this idea of the, of the divine, of an energy, right? The very idea that the universe moves in such a way as to promote goodness is ludicrous from any but the religious point of view. Right? If you are truly <clears throat> a scientist, the universe does not do anything because it wants to promote goodness. It just does stuff. Um, obviously, we don't know why it does stuff, and maybe scientists will sometime, someday find out that indeed the universe is acting to, uh, to uh, promote goodness um, I certainly think that it is. I think it may be that they'll figure it out someday. Um, I also think they won't figure it out someday because whatever there is to figure out is beyond our ability to figure out and that's, that's, and that's, gonna, that, that's not gonna change. But the point is to, to assert that the universe is moving to support goodness and righteousness in the world, um, to assert that um, we can have a, that, that our personal salvation, that is our ability to, to fully realize our humanness gives us an experience of godliness, right? Um, that, um, that, human, that the human self harbors the values of the spirit of holiness. These are ideas that can only be articulated from within a religious view. Right? So it's a very different um, perspective than a purely na pure naturalism 
or a pure rationalism or a pure scientism. It is a naturalism born out of faith. The faith is in the human being. But the faith is lodged in the human being because the human being is part of a larger system which is infused with a kind of energetic propulsion toward the good. Which I believe may be in ways that Kaplan himself couldn't quite articulate. And I don't mean that in any disrespect, I just mean that it was a different period in history. Um, that in a way, Kaplan's view um, is, is, is very close to being the only reason, the only um, attractive religious understanding of the world available to contemporary Jews. What was the last thing you said about the last few words? I didn't hear that. I don't know. I, go, I never. Okay, I know. I, I, um, okay. Well, it, it's very interesting what you're saying because this is what Einstein says, dry, one of the things that Einstein says. The further the spiritual evolution of mankind advances, the more certain it seems to me that the path to genuine religiosity does not lie through the fear of life and the fear of death and blind faith, but through striving after rational knowledge. Well, um, that sounds very much like Einstein. Well, you know, you're being a wise guy, <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> but the truth um, is, when we are trying to penetrate um, a knowledge of the existence is something we cannot penetrate of the manifestations of the profoundest reason and the most radiant beauty, it is this knowledge and this emotion that constitutes a truly religious attitude. And in this sense, he says he is alone, a deeply religious man. The idea is that everything that we as human beings are dealing with, striving for, um, has to do with our place and how do we make, how do we realize our place in terms of those with whom we live, the forces that we need, we need rain, we need sun, we need energy, um, to be um, fully, as much as possible, fully, fully realized. And that has to do with the truth of the imagination, as Keats says. Okay, so all of that is helpful and, and, and I think is, is, is definitely part of this conversation. Um, the, for, for Kaplan, I think just really what you were just saying, Barbara, for Kaplan, the idea that we are part of a self-actualizing universe uh, is true, right? That the universe itself is moving towards some kind of self-actualization, which means, in a sense, being the most perfect universe it can be. Just like self-actualization in a human context is to be the most perfect human you can be. And a self-actualizing universe requires self-actualizing human beings. We are part of the, right? So when the biblical story talks about God seeing the world and calling it good, or God, you know, doing this or doing that in terms of um, making a covenant with human beings, etc. Those are mythical insights or mythical expressions of the insights that we are bound together in this self-actualizing universe. And it is kind of like a, like a, a series of nesting dolls, Chinese dolls. We worry, we actualize ourselves, which means holding up the community around us, 
and holding up the community around that and holding up the community around that and until you reach a kind of messianic fervor where you're create, you know, trying to hold the entire world together on this, le on this level of values and that that somehow impacts the universe itself and nature itself. That we are, that, that the idea of salvation is a natural idea that it is not a mystical idea is really the point. That there is no kind of secret knowledge, but that rather salvation is a result or a process that results in human beings um, taking, playing their role in a self-actualizing universe. Now, if I could just stop for a second and switch gears. All of this, Two thirds or more of this article, which, by the way, I think is a, I don't know if anybody agrees or disagrees, but I think is a, a, a pretty brilliantly insightful article into the um, into the metaphysics of Kaplan. Um, and and there are not that many people who take metaphysics take Kaplan's metaphysics seriously, and Schulweis really does, uh, and and delves into them and 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 teases them out of Kaplan's writing. But having said all that, he realizes that in order to be a metaphysics, so to speak, Kaplan makes use quite clearly and quite purposely, makes use of language, which is as mystifying as any religious tradition, right? that to argue for this idea of goodness in the universe, to argue for this idea of a uh, implicit values within the human being, these are all scientifically unprovable. And if Kaplan thinks he's depending on science to illuminate the nature of the, of, 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 of the world and the nature of the human, he is fooling himself, right? That ultimately he is making religious assertions, right? Sharon? Okay, so isn't the question, what are we defining as scientific? I mean, couldn't we say that his ideas of self-actualization fit with the ideas of John Dewey, fit with the ideas of sociologists at the time who were seen as scientists in their own right? Yes, and I think that that's how Kaplan would, de would defend himself. I think in his time, he was using uh, the science I think by the time Schulweis is writing in the 1960s, that science is no longer considered to be um, irrefutable. It's considered to be social science, if you will. Um, and, um, and it has been replaced by neurological um, investigation in which everything that happens in what we think of as our consciousness is a result of brain activity, um, it's, uh, which is beyond my comprehension. Steve sent tools. me some really good things, uh, some interesting things to read about that this afternoon. I don't know if you want to say a word about that, Steve. Well, I actually wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, I, I, I can, but I wanted to talk about something a little bit different uh, and comment on the term that you used of a self-actualizing universe. And it seems to me that, um, we don't know where that's going. You know, we don't have a conception of, of an end point, you know, of what, what the goal of all that is. I think we have, a, a, you know, there's a sense of that it's, it's just ongoing, it's never ending. Maybe it's infinite, maybe it's, maybe it's eternal. You know, and that's one of the ways we talk about God. Um, on the other hand, I think if we, you know, in, in the context of Judaism, if we talk about a, um, we, when we do talk about an, uh, an end state or a goal, it's usually under the rubric of the messianic era. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, I think, frankly, if we had a conversation right now among us and tried to define what are the characteristics of the messianic era or what should it be, we'd find a lot of difference of opinion. I don't even know that we could ever even agree on what the, you know, messianic era, you know, should look like. 
anyway, I'll, I'll just put that out there. Uh, to come back to some of the other points, you know, and that I sent you some information about is, you know, is that a lot of this really is consistent with uh, the work, well, in the article, Schulweis talks about, you know, Eric Fromm and Karen Horney and Harry Sack Sullivan and Kurt Goldstein, you know, in the 30s and 40s who were cultivating this idea in the, the context of sort of existential psychology of, you know, self-realization, you know, self-fulfillment, et cetera. In the 1960s and 70s, it was the human potential movement, um, you know, in psychology and humanistic psychology and people like Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs you know, which started with this sort of, you know, more basic animal instinctual needs and moving up to the point of, you know, self-actualization or, or self-realization. Uh, in our own day, and I don't know how many people are familiar with the work of Martin Seligman at, at Penn um, and his development of this, you know, the concept of positive psychology in which he essentially took uh, a lot of Maslow's ideas, even though he never credits and he insists he never read or wasn't familiar with Maslow, but um, he sought to empirically verify, you know, what, what you know, uh, positive development looks like. And he, you know, developed this field called positive uh, psychology. Today, there are people who have studied with Seligman and, and that, you know, frame of of, of research and, and, and clinical work and developing ideas about what's called positive Judaism and positive Christianity and positive religion. And essentially what they do is, you know, they look at a, a sort of correspondence between, you know, what empirical psychology has identified in terms of, quote, well-being and health and looked at Jewish sources in this context to identify what are the, uh, you know, in the secular context, they might be called virtues. In the Jewish context, they're called either virtues or values, or specifically in the context of Musser, they're called midot, you know, the, the soul traits, the characteristics like generosity and uh, compassion and kindness and trust and um, humility and patience, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then the, the final step is, you know, what sort of sparked this that, that you mentioned, Rabbi Stone, was that there are people in the field of neuroscience who are actually analyzing in the context of brain development how, um, how our brains have, have evolved both historically as well as in the context of the human life cycle, you know, from baby, you know, through uh, progressive development. And that, you know, we start off with, you know, some of those animal instinctual uh, orientations, which, you know, here, uh, Schulweis is calling, you know, the, the will to the will to live, but then it's the higher level uh, aspects of the uh, you know, that move from the limbic system up to the frontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex, you know, and all of that that moves us into what he calls the will to maximum life. And does anybody know what the next stage in the development of the brain is? No, we don't, we don't know that at this point. Maybe, you know, maybe we could try to figure it out. I, I don't know if neuroscientists can figure that out. But, you know, it's this ongoing development of our brain that gives us this capacity for greater uh, ongoing self-fulfillment and, uh, and self-realization. And maybe there is no end point to it. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop. Oh, thank you. What is, what is Seligman's first name, please? Martin, Martin Seligman. S E L I G M A N. He's okay. Retired. I'll have to Google. So yeah, just as a footnote, just as a footnote, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the woman that uh, uh, co developed the program for the Center for Contemporary Muslim with me, Dr. Buitre, studied with Seligman. And there is a great deal of influence of positive psychology in the development of the contemporary Musser protocols. But that's a footnote. Um, but the, the point is, I mean, I think the, that um, Shulwai says, um, even were there no question concerning the empirical status of these life urges, a major gap in the position would exist all the same. The empirically verified character of human nature in no way entails or guarantees agreement that human nature ought to be fulfilled. In other words, I think what he's saying is that all the information that we gather scientifically still does not 
um, guarantee a, an external level of value, right? That human beings um, don't necessarily live in the universe any differently than any other species in the universe. And that human actions have no more meaning to the universe than in fact, the universe's continual evolution and, and development, right? A kind of classically secular critique, right? That Schulweis, who is not a secularist, I think, um, purposely brings here so that we don't get lost in the weeds of metaphysics, which ultimately Schulweis believes is not Kaplan's strong point. Right. He has tried to um, present those metaphysics, and he's tried to defend those metaphysics, and he's tried to suggest the sensitivity that that metaphysics represents. But he is aware of the fact that that, since that metaphysics is simply not empirically provable, any more or less than the metaphysics of medieval Jewish philosophy or mysticism. That in order to, to in a certain sense, in order to talk about meaning as a human being, you really can't make any empirical statements. There's always a kind of implicit faith in something external to the human being, right? Kaplan ultimately is comfortable calling that transnational, natural, as opposed to supernatural. And I think it's a useful term in, only because it, 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 um, it separates us from the usual kinds of things we think about with supernaturalism. But I don't think that it's significantly different, right? Because once it's not natural, once it's trans or super, then in a certain sense, you're, um, it, it's nitpicking, right? Um, and on the other hand, what good would, be, would a religious viewpoint be if it had to unswervingly conform to secularism? That's the question that Shulweis asked a few pages earlier. Right? If all this is true, what would we need Kaplan? If all this is true, what would we need religion? If all this is true, what would we need anything other than human nature actually act working at actualizing itself? Clearly, something's missing. Clearly, we don't automatically actualize ourselves. Um, in fact, sometimes we do the opposite of actualizing ourselves. We hurt ourselves. We do all kinds of crazy things. We do not act with reason. We do not act um, in the best interest of the, of the organism, either individually or communally. So there is something that Kaplan recognizes is needed to mediate between the natural world and the world of value. Um, so, Shulweis kind of says near the end of the article, it would be regrettable were our difficulties with both the will to live and the will to maximum life to cause us to overlook the genuine contributions soterics may make as a, kind, as a common hypothetical method of achieving salvation. Right, remember, as Sir Rice has pointed out from the beginning, Kaplan's soterics is a heuristic approach, right? It isn't that Kaplan creates a, mono, a, a monolithic explanation for the way in which the world operates or the universe operates or the human being operates. Rather, he, create, he posits a potential interpretation 
which may turn out not to be true. But in its, but as is, can serve as the basis for positive, practical application. And that ultimately, as Schulweis points out, Kaplan is way more interested in the practical, positive application than he is on proving that he has found the metaphysical answer. So he creates a metaphysics that's just good enough to support the program of behavior and communal renewal that he wants to suggest. Um, nevertheless, or in, key, in, in, in sort of in conclusion then, Schulweis summarizes the metaphysical structure. One, there exist certain universal biological, psychological, and social needs and interests in man. Two, the integrated gratification of these needs and interests is of value. Three, the world is so salvation conditioned as to enable their gratification. And that's basically Kaplan's metaphysics boiled down to its three basic premises, right? That we have certain biological, psychological, and social needs that we enjoy, if you want to use the word, or feel good about fulfilling those needs. And the world provides us with an opportunity to, in fact, fulfill them. And if we live our lives in such a way as to fulfill these biological, psychological, and social needs within a community which supports our ability to do that. Um, and in a world which gives us the uh, conditions to fulfill our needs, um, we will enjoy this experience of self, -grat of self um, uh, gratification, which he calls salvation. We will be the best human beings we can be. And in a certain sense, so we need nothing more. So isn't that really, is that really the teachings of, of Judaism? No. And, and if you look at it, 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 it I'm talking about talking about the golden rule, which is in Leviticus, the care for widows and orphans and the stranger, which is uh, was sort of revolutionary. And then the rabbinical interpretations, the promoted good and, and, and caring for, for others. Seems to me that's the way our religion developed. And it can be, you don't even need God for that if you just follow the precepts of the religious writings themselves. I mean, God, it's nice to, I think that's what God wants, but I don't think that's really important. I think what's important is what's, what the text is and what the, the moral is. So okay. okay, so you raised some really good points there. Number one, the answer to your first question is yes. That is what Judaism has been about. Um, not that Judaism is the only you know, way to reach these, under, these conclusions but that it is one of many cultural uh, creations which put um, this idea of self-actualization in terms of communal uh, goodness and, and mercy and justice and all the midot or values, et cetera, uh, at the center of the human experience, yes. Um, whether or not one needs God for that is in some ways a question of individual um, preference, right? Um, you can either not need God or you could say um, 
living this way is needing God. Or you could play other kinds of language games with the whole theological conundrum. I think the reason that Kaplan puts the God issue at the heart is precisely because of the um, the um, fossilization of the God idea in the Judaism that he was contemporary with, that he felt strongly was interfering with the ability of Jews to fully appreciate the salvic nature of Judaism, right? Because the, because the God idea in a certain sense had taken over Judaism, had, over, had overreached itself and become fossilized. Um, um, and then there's the third issue, which is that the Bible, despite all the nice things it has in it, as you just said, it also has a lot of other things in it, uh, including a lot of rituals and a developing tradition around those rituals, which begin and, and began, and in fact did overshadow those values that they were meant to embody. And that, the, again, Kaplan finds himself in a modern Judaism facing a ritualized and fossilized Jewish tradition, which can, is no longer viable from the perspective of modern experience, modern thought, modern science, right? That's, again, that's, I'm not trying to caricature traditional Judaism, but I think I am accurately describing Kaplan's understanding of that Judaism at that moment in history. And the last question that Schulweis raises, which I think is great because it leads us right into our next and last session next week, in which he says, um, um, once a person is informed that faith in a salvational cosmos is an instrument that gains for us moral optimism and strengthens our hearts, does his awareness reduce the efficacy of prayer? Will anyone recite Geshem, the prayer for rain, knowing full well that no powerful favors will ensue? Right. So the end of our course together will be to consider in a certain sense um, the impact of this theology and this way of thinking on some of the traditional notions of ritual and in particular prayer from Kaplan's point of view. Sharon? So before we go to that, I have to go back to what you were outlining as the three points of Kaplan's metaphysics. Uh, the first was we have certain biological, psychological interests or needs. The second was gratification of them is of value. The third, though, I'm not as sure of. Uh, what I wrote down from what you said is that the world is so salvation conditioned to enable their gratification. And that's not, maybe I... I'm quoting sure was there. Yeah, okay. Um, that doesn't seem like Kaplan to me, that third piece, because, and this is where prayer comes into it, I think the idea is that we need to work collectively through prayer and through other means in order to create that personal self-actualization, that communal self-actualization, and ultimately that salvation. Okay, That's how well, I've understood it. Rabbi. Let's, Let's see what um, what next week's article help uh, what light that sheds on it. But I, it, to, to to answer quickly, I would just say that the idea that the world enables their gratification is a pretty broad idea, right? So even the idea that it's that that you have to form communities and that you have to work within those communities is still uh, is still unfolding in the context of a of a world that enables that unfolding to take place. That there is something in the world. 
Cool. How do we deal with how do we deal with racism? How do we deal with all the problems in our society if the world is so salvation conditioned inevitably to enable everyone's gratification and self-actualization? Those those ideas don't work for me. Uh, what you know what makes more sense, I think, is the idea that um, you know collectively we need to work together to ensure everyone's self-actualization, that there's nothing inevitable in everyone becoming self-actualized unless we no. function in such ways as to secure the self-actualization of each and every person, which has to be individual and has to be within communities. Hey, Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm I'm not sorry to interrupt, um, but we have another, we have the, the 830 minion waiting. Okay. Sorry, so, David. Thank you. Yeah. We will have to pick this up, Sharon. It's a good point. So mm -hmm. I will remember it, make a note of it, and we'll talk about it next week. Thank you all. Good night. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Next week, a photo, Sharon. Again. Sorry? Is next week, also at 7 o'clock. Yes. Thank you.